Good evening out there. Nice to be back. So let's give people a couple more minutes to join. So the first time um, having kind of a background music um, to my videos. Um, yeah, that's an interesting experiment. Hope you like it. Uh, if not, let me know. Um, yeah, that's probably, uh, as I said, the first time I'm doing this. Um, and yeah, so today's topic is an add-on to the session we had last week about the Nginx JavaScript module and how to extend the Nginx configuration with custom code. Um, the today's session is kind of split into two different things. The first one is a basic JavaScript um, overview. So what is JavaScript? How is it working? Um, what we can do with it? What is the ECMAScript standard? Uh, because this is very important to understand how NJS works and what is supported and what not. Um, so that's probably the first time. Um, something between 35 and 40 minutes, maybe. So if you are familiar with JavaScript, ECMAScript in general, feel free to skip the first part, the first 40 minutes. Um, second part of this live stream will be about NJS and it will be a deep dive into the demos we had last week in our Nginx JavaScript um, live event. Uh, so let me get started here. Um, so again, one more time. Um, this is the slide deck from last week. My name is Timo Stark. I'm working as a product management engineer for Nginx and I'm your host today. And so pretty cool that you're around and we can do a couple of things today. Um, as mentioned, 
first I will do a little of bit of a recap from last week's session. And then we will start in uh, about JavaScript in general. So what it is, what is ECMAScript and all that, all that stuff. And the second part will be at NJS deep dive and Q and A. So if you have questions, feel free to paste it in the chat. I'll try to answer them during the video. I have the chat open here, so that should work. Um, let me just jump over a couple of slides from last week. Um, so NJS, the JavaScript module or the JavaScript um, add-on for Nginx configuration. Uh, so it exists since 2015, so pretty, uh, pretty new um, when it comes to the overall Nginx timeline. Um, and what, so there are a couple of options around how to customize Nginx configuration or how to add custom code to Nginx configuration. Um, let's start on the left. You can write your own C modules, right? For Nginx, this is absolutely doable. It's possible. Um, you have very great, a good access to the internal faces um, of Nginx. So this is a very powerful way, but it is complex to do. It is not easy to learn. It is not something you can, you can easily, you can easily do and deploy. Um, two more is a Perl and Lua uh, extension. Um, the Lua extension or the Lua module is very, very well known in the community. Um, the Lua JIT module, or it's based on Lua JIT and all those stuff, um, Lua scripting to enhance Nginx configuration is, is really widely spread in the community. Um, and the new thing here is to add JavaScript or to extend the configuration of Nginx with JavaScript, with real JavaScript. And um, to make this work and to make this possible, we have two different things. One is the JavaScript engine that runs the JavaScript code. And the second part is the JavaScript module. And we will learn how to, do, how to use it and how to develop JavaScript for Nginx in the second phase um, of, this, of this live stream. Um, so these are basically the slides from Dimitri from last week. I will just jump over it, uh, do a little, very, very short recap. Um, why do we need scripting for Nginx? We have directives um, in Nginx to configure the behavior of Nginx. And, but sometimes this is not specific enough. This is not, this is not that what we need in this use case. This is not what we want. We need some tweaks and some more complex stuff. That's why we need scripting inside of our Nginx configuration. That's what I already said. We have the JavaScript engine that's created by Nginx. So it's not, it's not forked. It's not something that already exists like V8 um, um, that runs Node.js and Chrome. Um, it is really something that was specifically built for Nginx and for the Nginx use case. And the second part is the Nginx module um, to load the JavaScript code inside of the Nginx configuration. This is interesting. So please remember those things, ES5.1 and ES6. What is ECMAScript 6? What is ECMAScript 5.1? Make a side note, ES5.1, ES6, because we will come to this in a second. Right, so yeah, JavaScript is blocking aware. Um, this is this is quite important when it comes to how Nginx works with this non-blocking infrastructure. And we will do exact this example here with this fetch um, in the second part of this of this live stream. And we do a, a really hands-on demo using an Nginx fetch um, in a in a JavaScript for for stream. Right, yeah, so let's jump over all that and yeah, and come to the and come to the demo part. Cool. 
So again, um, let me just do a quick, let me show you something real quick. Um, if you if you haven't seen the, the video from last week, let me quickly bring that up for you. It is Nginx, let's search for custom code. That should bring it up. Um, that's exactly this one here. So if you haven't checked out this one, Nginx JavaScript module from last week, um, I'll paste that link in the chat here because this is a, it's a pretty, was a pretty good session, good questions. So make sure you check this out after that session. Great. So let's start um, with what is JavaScript. And there is another video from me that is a couple of years old. And unfortunately, I don't have the slide deck. I don't have the slide deck, but I can link it here. Um, it is from 2018. I can link it as well in the chat. Let me paste that in here. Um, and it explains some basics about JavaScript. So um, if you want to check that out. So and unfortunately, I do not have the presentation of the slides anymore available. Um, so we have to do a little bit of a of a guided tour through a couple of uh, articles and write-ups on the on the public internet. So let's get started with what is JavaScript. Um, so first of all, thanks to Oz Zero, um, they have a great article about what is JavaScript and the history about JavaScript, and they will use this one here uh, from Sebastian. Great article and. Right, so I will, I will not read it like a book. I will try to explain how I learned JavaScript and how, how I learned what it is and how it works. Um, yeah, first of all, JavaScript itself is quite old, right? So it started back in 1995 with uh, Netscape, well, the, which is the X Mosaic browser or the Mosaic browser was the first one, um, the first browser with a graphical user interface available for the public. Um, and that changed the way the internet wor worked at this point. So back in 1995 and yeah, JavaScript was an, was an idea of making the, the websites more interactive and more dynamic before JavaScript, it was literally not possible to have dynamic content on a website. It was all static content with HTML, for example. And yeah, the, the invention of JavaScript change that or it, it was so the idea was to change this behavior that we can have some dynamic data um, on those websites and the interesting part here so why is it called javascript um, is that a couple of very very intelligent people uh, try to bring those a language a scripting language into the browser's engine and it was, so initially it was something like, let's use Java as a, as a point where we can get started and modify it and bring it into the browser engine. So that's why we have this name JavaScript today, um, because this is exactly what it is here. It's like bring Java and make it somehow available for the browser, um, right? So they, they named it JavaScript. I know it's confusing, especially for people getting started with web development and JavaScript, because it is this, it is this mix in the, in the name that you have Java and JavaScript. Is it the same? Is it different? You can, you can think about that. The syntax of Java and JavaScript is similar, but they're totally separate languages, right? So from the syntax perspective, from the, if you want from the art of write the code, it is similar, but from the technology inside of the language, it's completely different. So that was where it was started. I mean, 1995 is, is almost 30 years ago. Um, so I was born in 1991. So I was <laughs> literally four years old um, when this whole JavaScript thing um, yeah, came out. And yeah, this is what I mean. This is Java syntax. 
And this is JavaScript syntax. So you see this curly braces um, and it is, it is like Java syntax, but it has nothing to do with JavaScript, with Java and JavaScript. So they two different languages. So, and a very, very important thing when it comes to what is JavaScript and what it, yeah, how is it defined and how it works and, and all that stuff is, I mean, we can go through this thing here and prototype object model and what the language is, but I'll come to this one in a second. The more important part is this, ECMAScript and JavaScript as a standard. Um, so another confusing thing here is that somehow people think that ECMAScript is another JavaScript or is another scripting language. Um, and it is probably, as printed out here, the standard and JavaScript is the implementation of this exact standard. So given that, and this is part of my um, slides and presentation I've just shared from uh, back in 2018. If you want to think about ECMAScript or ES, so that's why I told you make a little side note with this ES 5.1 and ES 6, ECMAScript is the standard. So if you want to understand how a, a scripting language or how, how you can write an engine to interpret like JavaScript, you need to follow the ECMAScript scripting standard. And we will have a look into it, into this standard in a second. And uh, JavaScript itself is like an implementation of this standard. And uh, yeah, this is, this is what we have here. So ECMAScript is our standard we follow um, when it comes to, when it comes to an implementation of a, of the language. And I have found a pretty interesting fact today. Um, that's why I want to show you this because the ECMAScript standard is available online. Um, of course. Um, so let me go one step back here and open this link in a new tab. And let's have a look. So the ECMA 262 standard, um, which is probably totally fine. And then you have here, here a list of standards, the newest 2022, and here I got a DNS, and I was a little bit confused um, be right before the session because I love this online representation of the ECMAScript standard, and I digged a little bit around, and they have a new link here hosted on GitHub. TC39 GitHub IO ECMA 262. So if you want to follow the ECMAScript standard and browse and uh, read through it, make sure you're using uh, the GitHub link. That will probably redirect you to this one. Yes, but I don't know why this is a thing, but it looks like the old link is not working anymore. So the, the old link they have on the website and we are referencing to is not working anymore, but the GitHub link is working. Just uh, interesting to know because I run into the same issue. Clicking on this button will, yeah, will bring you to a non-resolvable host name and uh, this GitHub one works. Great. So as I said, the ECMAScript standard is like the standard where we build JavaScript on. And interesting facts are the additions. And you see this here. So the first edition, 997, 998, 999, third edition. The fourth edition was something like a working draft, but it was never released to the public. That's why this thing is not available. So, um, but it doesn't really matter to us at this point, right? So it's good to know. It's this $1 million question. If somebody asks you what, what was the release date of the uh, ECMA 262 fourth edition, then you can proudly say it was never released to the public. Um, 
So then we have 8th edition and at the moment it is the 11th edition, I guess, with um, yeah, the current version of from last year. All right, so this is important when it comes to our NJS reference and uh, compatibility list here because we reference to the scripting standards, ECMAScript 5.1, ECMAScript 6. So that's why it is important to know that there is something that is called ECMAScript and what is ECMAScript and how we can use this information, what ECMAScript is, to sharp our knowledge about the scripting language JavaScript or the programming language JavaScript, right? As JavaScript is super popular nowadays, but a lot, a lot, a lot of developers do not know what was the beginning of JavaScript. They just, it, it, it's, it's more than just do an NPM init and NPM install million of packages and then getting started with Node.js um, development. Personally, I feel I need to understand why is a programming language working as it is. So, and to know this, I have to understand where it comes from. So this is the, this is the case for JavaScript, um, pretty old language, 1995, 1997, ECMAScript standard is the standard behind the implementation of JavaScript. And if you want to know if something is supported in a given version of a engine, for example, V8, you can check what is the current implementation standard of the ECMAScript. So that's exactly what we do with NJS. If we say we have almost 5.1 completely supported and a couple of features from ECMAScript standard ES6, then you understand and know now, all right, what, what does it mean, right? So that's the that's why I, I, I felt it was pretty important um, to talk about this, I wouldn't say boring topic, but to go into details, what is behind JavaScript and what is behind the code. So, oh, nice, Internet Explorer 5. So this was a pretty intense thing, um, the ECMAScript 4 and with all the features. And I mean, most of those features we see here um, are even very powerful today. I mean, packages, interfaces, classes, all that stuff is not new. It is, it was 1999, um, pretty old, um, a little bit more than 20 years. So let's see, 5.1, nice action script. Another implementation of the ECMAScript standard. Um, there should something around for 5.1, ECMAScript 5, the rebirth of JavaScript that really was. After a long struggle of ECMA 4, that we know now was never released, the ECMA 5 was kind of the new the new hot thing that came out back in 2000 was it 2011 2012 looks like so just imagine there was a decade of almost a decade 10 years <laughs> between the release 3 and then the work on release 4 and the finally release number 5 and if you look at this this is exactly the stuff that makes JavaScript super powerful for our nowadays web application. Um, these object methods, the JSON stuff. Um, so the, the array methods is something we will use in our examples later. So it's all ECMAScript standard five and six right and this is something i want to highlight that the promises um is something we have implemented into uh, njs as one of the features from es6 ecmascript standard six 
as well as the let and const uh, is something we, we work on right now. Um, and I will introduce let and const as well as, yeah, we can introduce an row function, why not? Um, if you have any specific questions, make sure you write it down in the chat. If you want to learn something specific about ES5 or 6, if not, I will pick some interesting topics like promises, what is a promise and um, letting const. Um, that is important when it comes to uh, a good understanding about what is what is global scope, what is functional scope, what is hoisting uh, in JavaScript. Um, but this is something I will do here in, a, in an example with you in a second. Great. So I think that's that's totally fair and enough from theoretical things about JavaScript. Um, one thing I found on Wikipedia, blame me because I have used Wikipedia, um, <laughs> but interesting enough is that this is already a thing here that our NJS rendering engine is part of this list about ECMAScript engines, which is not more saying than all those engines in this list. I don't think it's a complete one, but it looks very, 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 very detailed is a list of JavaScript interpreters that can interpret ECMAScript standard languages like JavaScript. Why I'm saying like JavaScript is because ActionScript, um, yeah, you may, you may know ActionScript from the early, what is it, 2010 maybe? Um, this, I think it was bought by Adobe, um, this little this little flash hype in the internet. Um, ActionScript is something that is aligned to the ECMAScript standard, but it is not JavaScript. That's why I'm saying ECMAScript like rendering engines because saying those are all JavaScript would not be correct. That's why I'm saying engines that can render languages that are aligned to the ECMAScript standard like JavaScript or ActionScript. Let me see if we can find something here. Yeah, Tamarine ActionScript engine used by Dome Flash. That's what I'm saying. Um, so JScript is the Microsoft answer um, of a JavaScript rendering engine. SpiderMonkey Mozilla V8 is Google. Um, yeah, and you, you probably, yeah, it's, it's written here. So Google Chrome is based on V8. So the new Microsoft Edge browser is based on uh, the V8 rendering engine and Node.js. We'll use Node.js today. Um, use the V8 engine under the hood as well. Right, so then we have a couple of others and we have our NJS interpreter as well. Pretty neat. Cool. So a little recap. What did we, what did we learn in uh, our last uh, 20 minutes? We know that JavaScript is a programming language that was kind of invented back in 1995 that follows the standard ECMAScript, the ECMAScript standard. There are other programming languages like ActionScript that follows the ECMAScript standard as well. And if you want to see how compatible a specific engine is with a specific ECMAScript standard, you can check the features inside of the ECMAScript standard. Uh, you can check the website and then you can check the features here on the on the left side and can check what version of ECMAScript was that feature introduced. And then you can check, all right, what rendering engine I'm using. Does this rendering engine support this ECMAScript standard? So this thinking is very, very important because when we come to the NJS development in the second part, we will see that 
this information are very, very important to understand the documentation of NJS, what you can use and what you cannot use. So that's, that's why I'm, I'm a little bit going into detail here. So, but now it's enough for, for, uh, for theoretical stuff. So let's dive into and make some, do some examples, write some JavaScript code. Um, first of all, I want to sh share some resources I'm using to learn, understand, um, JavaScript and to write JavaScript and uh, have some hands on hands on references. So one is a book from O'Reilly JavaScript, the defined guide, um, pretty good one. It's not like a handbook. It's not too thin. <laughs> so it's a very, 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 very big book, uh, over a thousand pages. Yeah. Over a thousand pages. Um, I'm pretty sure it will be available in some ebook format like uh, Kindle or whatever, um, PDF, but yeah, I'm using, I'm using this book even today. Um, when I do some, some JavaScript development and when I'm thinking about different, different implementation methods, or if I'm, if I want to, to research something, I will. So anything I need will be in this book. So, right. So that's why I have it and all the demos we have here and all these little pitfalls, um, are described in this book as well. So if you want to have a, a reference, a re good reference, you can use, uh, this book as a getting started point. Another one, another thing I want to share with you is the MDN web docs from Mozilla. So there is a whole section about JavaScript, very, very, very detailed, very well documented, and you will find quite any answer to any of your question. So a second reference, um, happy to share the MDM web docs for, for JavaScript. Uh, I, th yeah, this one is a great one. Um, I have used that one. It's a uh, JavaScript first steps. So what do we need? Yeah. Um, to get started. I mean, yeah, what do we need? We need a web browser and, uh, some sort of HTML file or whatever we can, we can write JavaScript into it. That's one answer. The more technically correct one would be, we need an interpreter. We need an engine that can run our JavaScript code. And that can be V8, Node.js, right? That can be a Chrome browser that can be NJS, right? So that's exactly what we need. We need something that can interpret and run our JavaScript. And that's what we want to do. So let's get started with the basic examples here. So how you get, how you can get started. So as I said, we need something that runs our, or interprets our JavaScript code. So let's create a new file and call it start.js empty. Great. Um, so now we know that console log is a thing and we start here with hello world, we put the semicolon in it. And now I can use node and I can say start JS and this will print out hello world. Okay. Now you can say, look, um, there is no script tag or something like this attached to, to this file. That's correct. That's because we're using Node.js. If we would do this in a browser in an, in an, in an, like in a web browser, uh, we need to wrap this around the script tag right? Like this. So exact same thing. And this is then we can type this a little bit Rick text JavaScript, right? So this is the 
this would be the implementation when it is a HTML file. We have HTML here, right? So this would be the this would be the case. All right, but good for now. Um, we use Node.js in this case, the V8 rendering engine to test our to test our scripts here, and this is pretty handy when it comes to the development and the creation of logic and code for NJS as well, especially when we come to the NJS part where we use node modules and pre-compiled node modules um, to enhance functionality in, in NJS. This Node.js way of working is pretty handy when it comes to debugging functions and logic that's maybe not part of um, not part of your own NJS code. All right, so let me use our book here um, as a little reference, what I wanna show you. Um, this is not scheduled as a, as a whole JavaScript uh, getting started beginner's guide, um, but I will, I will give you a couple of examples um, about how JavaScript works technically. Um, right, so first of all, when we start, let's start with this one. We have a variable called scope, a function, we call the function and we print out the variable um, value here, great. So JavaScript is basically, or can be, you can, you can, you can think about the scope, a scope means where I can use a variable or where I can declare a variable, where I can see or print a value of a given variable. And JavaScript has two main scopes. One is global, so something like this. So this is a variable in global scope. And another thing here is that JavaScript is function scoped. So function scoped means that this scope variable here will be available inside of the function if, this is the critical part, defined inside the function context. So let's use this here as an example and say node var.js. So we return local. We return local because the variable is defined globally and as it is globally defined, we assign a new value to the variable scope that's already globally defined. So let's change this to var scope. Call this and see what that is. See, now it's global. So I'm pointing that out, this, this scope. I don't say it's a problem. I say you have to be aware of that this is a thing in JavaScript. This little var here can change the habit of your whole implementation of your whole program, right? That's exactly the reason why I'm pointing this out because I had issues like that in my life, millions, 10,000, 1,000, whatever, but that's why I'm pointing this out. Be aware of the scope JavaScript handles its its variables. An answer to this problem, to especially this problem with var, are let and const. I mean, you have heard about let something equals to test, and we have something like const, constant equals constant. So, I mean, you have heard about this, let and const and var, and I will explain you what are the differences here. So const is basically a variable. It doesn't matter where you define it at this point. A constant can be declared and assigned just once over 
the lifetime of this of this program so const constant in this case means i can use the constant variable but i cannot reinitiate so i cannot type somewhere else const constant can't type today constant equals something else this will not work and this will not work with const i cannot reinitiate and i cannot reassign any value to a constant i can do this just once so means if you want to do something that definitely cannot be changed over the runtime of your of your program of your javascript um, make sure you're using const let is something similar let uh, we have something here something test so so what does what does it mean what 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 does what what, what does it mean to have something like let something test mm -hmm. can i do something like something equals to test two great and can i print out test two so let's do this and console log let's print out what was the constant constant Great, so let's see. Something. Hmm. So this doesn't work. Great. I will explain why in a second. So let's move that in here. Hmm. I think that's because it's a reserved word. Let's call that R1. Well, it doesn't matter. Mm, what is it saying? Console G. That's because of a typo. Things for console console dot log. All right. So we have test two. We have local. And we have constant. All right. Great. So let's. Yeah, let's be specific. Let's try to say var number one is something else. Blah, blah, blah. Assignment to a constant variable. You cannot reassign a value to a constant variable. Good, we proved that is a thing. Okay. And we thought probably that let is something, again, scope to the function, but it will not be available in this case, outside of this function scope. That's why this log works only inside of the function. But let's try this. Let's try this. So that works. But as you see, the let is something that cannot be, it can be re, re declared and reassigned outside of a, of a scope, but this would work as var. You can say var something test, var something else test, and this will work. So let's try this. And then So this is probably the thing with let that you can reassign a value to a variable defined with let, but you cannot redeclare. Redeclare means I do let something again. I did that somewhere in my scope. So this is global scope. The other one is function scope. And I, do, I try to do this again. You can do this with var without any problem. Right, so with var it will it will work in this case, um, but not here. Well, let's get rid of it. So that means let something test and test two. This is not defined. So this will work. 
So to break this down or to boil this down to a statement, we can remember is that var is something that already exists for years. You can use it if you understand how you can use it. It's not a problem. Remember the scopes, global scope, function scope. Remember this problem with having something without the var important um, to not accidentally override values in your in your program if you can make use of let and const let's understand what is let and what is const const means in one sentence this variable can only be assigned and declared once you cannot redeclare and cannot reassign any value to this variable somewhere else in your program that is a constant let means you can declare this variable once you cannot have something like let something variable name inside of a scope two times but you can declare it once and you can assign it multiple times that's what we do here we assign it initially with the value test then we assign another value test number two to the already declared variable so that means something was not undefined at this point we assigned test to those are the three types of variables something uh, let const var and yeah we're working on uh, the let and const support um, for njs uh, actively and we'll release it pretty soon from what I what I heard. So um, be prepared to rewrite your whole JavaScript NJS code and introduce let and const. Um, yeah, excited, can't, can't wait. I will definitely do a video um, about let and const with NJS at the point it, it will be released or at the point it will be public um, available. Can't wait to do it. Cool, so we remember scopes, we remember let and const and var basically it's all that it's all here in that book that's why i love it it's super super detailed um and now let me i have some marks here can't see it some of my bookmarks <laughs> um because those are exactly those topics I run into or ran into a couple of times and I want to yeah, learn more and that's why I bookmarked them. And yeah, so that's basically that's basically our example number one um, about the scopes. Um, let me try uh, type, yep. So, and um, let's make another example for that introduce or that shows the, the way JavaScript works with function scope versus global scope. Let me explain this example here a little bit. We have a function that called test that takes an input, which is an object. It doesn't really matter what it is. It could be anything, it could be a string. I just need something like an if to show you that we have different blocks of code, different logical blocks, like an if statement, which is probably a block of logic with a for loop, which is another block. And we have a function that wraps everything. All right, so back to the thing we have already learned that our variables are function scoped or globally scoped. So what does it mean they are functional scoped in javascript there is something that called hoisting and that is probably the explanation of what is functional and what is globally scoped that means that before the javascript engine executes this piece of code it looks for all variables declared in this function what do we have we have i we have J and we have K. 
And the JavaScript engine will move per definition of this functional scope, all the declarations on top of the function body. So that means var i, var j, and var k, the declaration will be at the top of the function scope. The assignment of the value 0 and 0 is a different story. So this can happen here. But what we see from this script is that we have a declaration var j equals 0, which is a declaration and an assignment of an initial value in one step inside of an if. And we have another one inside of a for loop. But based on what we already learned, that JavaScript is functional scoped, we have access to k, j, and i in the entire function. That's why I can say log k outside of the for scope because we are still in the function. That's why I can log j outside of its if block because the declaration of this variable happens functional based like here always. This is JavaScript logic of, of taking care of your, of your functional and global scope. And I have, I was not aware of this for years, not kidding. F four years, five years, or oh, maybe, yeah, four years. And I had a lot, a lot, a lot of problems. And that's why I started digging into this basically by buying this book and start reading about what is, what is this? What does it, what does it do to my program? And at the point where you understand this concept of, of um, how JavaScript treats your variables, it becomes very, very clear how that works. So we do this and check the scope number two. See, J is zero. So let's change this to one. So it's inside the if block and we act, we can, yeah, we have access to this variable from, from outside the if block. And it's basically something that's scoped to the function. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm saying this because I saw a couple of NJS implementations where a customer had problems with exactly something like this, right? And that's why I'm saying, make sure you understand how those variables, um, how those variables work. Um, so we are approaching the top of, of our hour, uh, still have five, 53 minutes in the, in the stream. I get super, super easy, excited about doing programming and scripting and explaining. So <laughs> that's why I need to hurry up a little bit, um, and uh, jump with you in the NJS part. All right. Um, so next thing is another another example of um, yeah how to write basically JavaScript. We have a function that's called greeting, um, and we have basically a very very simple simple output. We send a name, and then we check if the type of. And I've used that example because this is in NJS sometimes pretty interesting to see what's the type of a given variable. Um, one thing you have noticed during the last hour is in Java, for example, you have to declare a type to any variable. So you have to say this variable is a string. Great. This variable is a Boolean. This variable is a number, a float, a double, an object. JavaScript does not have this strict typeness than Java, for example. I can assign to my variable name an integer, then I can reassign a string, I can reassign an array, which is basically an object, without any problem. This is good and bad behavior in JavaScript at the same time. Um, 
not be a, not be aware of what can be inside of my of my variable what kind of type what kind of of data type is sometimes a little bit problematic um but this will be above this uh this video today but uh, there are interesting fun facts about dealing with types um so back here we are checking if the type of name is a string if so we want to return hello with my name and if it's not a string if it's undefined or if it's object or anything else than a string we won't just print hello world so in this example i want to show you that we can make this a little bit more short and nice um, because this is something very nice and neat if you can type something like this in NJS. Um, so this is basically the same logic. It does the exact same thing, but in just one line of code. So we say return if, if type of name equals string, question mark and colon. And the another million dollar question is what is this What's the name of this operator, of this question mark colon thing? Um, yeah, fun fact, it's called Elvis operator because it, it should look like Elvis with this question mark colon as eyes thing. Um, Google a picture of Elvis and try to imagine this question mark colon thing. Uh, let's do this. Probably. Let's do this fun fact. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, why ever? Somebody thinks that this looks like Elvis. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, this is, this is a short, this is a short if statement. If the type of string is, or the name is string print hello name, if not print hello world. Um, another cool thing I want to show you that will work with NJS as well is um, this nice way of printing out concatenated strings or strings with variables in it. So you can use this um, special backticks. Uh, I don't know the, the exact English name for, for it. Um, this reverted backticks and use a dollar sign and curly braces with a variable name to have a variable or the value of the variable inside of your of your printed string. Pretty neat. Um, so let's run the if one JS test. Oh, that's interesting. So first is hello, my name, and the second one is world. We call the first one with my with a name and the second one with something that's not a string. It's basically an object. Right. Cool. So this is, um, yeah, again, we are on top of the hour almost. Um, I could tell you the another three hours about JavaScript and advanced techniques and arrays and objects and prototypes and all that, all that fancy stuff. Um, yeah, I advise you to use a good reference as a book, a printed book. I love printed books um, or something like um, the MDN JavaScript JavaScript reference, which is also very, very detailed and good to read. And uh, you will find probably all your all your questions uh, will be answered here. Um, great. Good. So a little recap, one minute, um, what we learned in the last 50 minutes, we learned where JavaScript comes from, that it is a programming or scripting language that follows the ECMAScript standard. We are now aware of where to find information about the ECMAScript standard. So it's ECMA-international.org. Um, and in here you will find all the, you will find the GitHub link to the current representation of the of the uh, ECMAScript standard. And we saw a list 
of rendering engines of JavaScript interpreters that follows specific versions of uh, the ECMAScript standard. So that's basically what we have learned in the last hour. And in the next hour, we will jump directly into our NJS project and do hands-on things, basically the same demos or kind of the same demos we did um, during the webinar or the, the live stream last week, but with a little bit more context. And um, on top of the examples of the three examples from last week, I will do some more NJS examples like um, NJS filters for the stream module. So for TCP or layer four um, proxying or load balancing. So stay tuned. We will be back after a short break, not longer than a minute. Um, and then we will catch up with NJS. So stay tuned, be with me and I will be back in a minute. So hello back. How we are still awake. Um, that's probably 9 p.m. for me right now, uh, which is not too bad um, to do a coding session here. Great, cool. So let's get started with our NJS demo here. So as mentioned, we had a very, very, very great session last week about uh, how to extend Nginx configuration with uh, custom JavaScript. And um, yeah, this is something I wanna, we wanna use as a baseline and uh, add some more butter to it. Um, so again, I will, uh, go through this 
to this um, initial demos and at the same time we'll show you uh, a stream demo as well so I move this up here make this big enough so you can probably read it all right all right so let's make this a little bit smaller and bigger and exit here so you see this is nothing magical no nothing fancy um, we start with a nginx container docker container and we load the nginx configuration uh, there is a little start script so let's see what's in here we do docker run um, we share the nginx configuration as well as the conf d directory which will be included in the nginx conf so nothing special nothing new to you um, to people that used nginx um, at least once nothing nothing really fancy so let's have a look inside the nginx uh, config and let me probably do this with uh, vs code so we can read it probably all right so as mentioned we have two different modules to work with njs so remember back to the very 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 start of this session we have the javascript engine that runs and interprets the javascript code this is part one of the njs solution we have for nginx and part number two of this puzzle is our module our language module that makes the the uh, the directives we need to load javascript code inside of the nginx configuration available um, and we have probably two different ones we have one for the http context if you're keen and say oh wait what is a http context and what is a stream context um yeah follow me here on youtube i have a docs masterclass video explaining uh what is http what is a stream context and how they play together um so make sure you check this one out and yeah i so said we have the http module and we have a stream module so let's check the documentation so the documentation again um i have docs masterclass video that covers um everything about nginx documentation and on nginx.org there is here down on the right bottom here the njs link so click on that and here we have our two modules we have nginx httpjs module for the http context with the directives you can use and we have the same for stream you may notice that for stream we have other directives than we have for http context and that's probably the reason or that's 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 because the http context works different than the stream context that's why we have something like js filter for stream but not for uh, the http context in this case all right so let's make sure we load both modules before we start so to do this make sure before the event section inside of the main nginx configuration you type load underscore module i cannot type module and then modules slash nginx stream dot so um so yeah good question um what why is it modules and um it is as i said not not too magical um so let's go inside of the container docker execute it njs i want to have a bash shell so let's go in nginx there is a folder called modules so anytime you have something like load modules and there is no not not a slash before this this is relative to the main configuration file or uh, the main configuration directory of nginx which is default etc uh, nginx you can have an absolute path etc 
nginx that will work as well or we do this um, <clears throat> same for include see good so now we load nginx stream.js module and http module so let's see if this works i do probably the same here i do execute interactive tty in my njs container with a bash shell so this is one thing or i can do docker we can do this exec and then nginx s reload so this will reload the nginx configuration inside of uh, your container without terminating it by the way um, had a couple of questions on stack overflow i how can i restart nginx if i did some changes in the container you do not have to you can send a special signal to the nginx process to reload the configuration so that means the master process will stay as is and you just reload uh, the configuration um, good so that means we have two modules right now one for http and one for stream and let me start with the stream context as this one was not covered in our live stream um, from last week. And there was a question how I can use the stream or how I can uh, use NJS in stream. Great. So let's create a stream context here. And in stream, we can create a server. And in the server, we have a listen directive. Let's say 8,900. That should do the trick. Um, and there is a good example here that we can follow. So now let's use this one. Oh, by the way, I want to, before we dig into uh, a lot of things here, I want to give big, big, big kudos and thank yous to Dimitri, uh, the, the main creator behind the NJS project at Nginx because Dimitri maintains a GitHub repository with NJS examples. And I want to show you this. NJS examples site is github.com. Oops. Oops. Uh, let me share this in the chat. This is an absolutely neat and great source of truth uh, when it comes to NJS development. It's always up to date, to be very honest. Um, so at the point where we have a new release, um, with new features, you can be sure that we will have some examples inside of this repository. Um, so make sure you follow it um, and yeah, bookmark it. So let's see and check this out, what we have here. So we have a JS import and we have an auth request JS prepared return backend 881 and we have main validate okay so let's explain what we have here and then let's let's implement it and see and see what it does um, so the stream context is tcp load balancing or proxying layer 4 and what we do here is we load and javascript file auth request and we use something like G js prepared so and it's the same thing if you want to check what we can use and what's what directives we can use um, we can check out the modules documentation so this is reference here 
or you can use, let's see, this is working, nginx.org slash r slash js prepared. Yep. So this master trick, how to find quickly a directive documentation is a life hack from, from the docs masterclass video a couple of weeks ago. Um, so nginx.org slash r slash directive name will bring you directly to this one. And we use JS pre pre-read and pre-read means that's an NJS function that will be called at the pre-read phase. So pre-read phase is interesting. That means reading the initial bytes of data into the pre-read buffer to allow modules such as to analyze the data before processing it. So that means we are reading the first byte of the incoming request in the stream context. And that's what when we do an authentication. So we verify something. Cool. So that's what we do using the pre-read. So what else do we have? We have pre-read, we have access phase, we have filter phase. Um, yeah, let's follow this example with a pre-read. Let's close those stuff here and JS pass sets the, uh, it's like the, the JS import statement. Well, this looks like JS path can be used to define overall a, a path for where our files sit. It says additional path for NJS modules. Yeah, let's do this. Let's follow the example from Dimitri. Um, let's not check it out. Let's write it from scratch to see if this is working. All right, so inside of the stream, we have lips. So let's create a new folder that called modules just to follow the thing here. So we have JS path. JS path. There we go. JS path was etc. And then we have nginx conf.d and then modules. And then we use JS import. And the JS import function is, this, is the same logic we had from last week. Uh, now we import logic from a given JavaScript file into our NJS. Um, engine or into our nginx configuration to be processed processed by the njs rendering engine so this is this named import this module named import um, i mentioned last week so that means when we say main from and then inside of modules let's do this auth request.js and then go in here and then say new file, auth request.js. So that means we have now all the functions we export in auth request.js available inside of the main namespace, if you want. So this is something what you can see here. So it's like main dot prepare verify or the pre-read verify, sorry. Um, so this main here comes from, from this. So this is pretty, pretty handy when you have, let's say you have two files with the same word, with the same name, you can have different um, namespaces here or module names. So let's, um, let's keep this here and check the source code. Stream auth request.js. So what do we have here? All right. Um, so pre-read verify is our function name and we export the function name down here. 
And as mentioned last week, we are now inside of the stream context. So inside of the stream context means that we are importing a stream object here in another request. So R is for request for HTTP. We'll see this after the stream demo and S is for stream. So, um, so then we have the stream on. And now I want to show you how to read the documentation according to a code snippet we have um, from GitHub, from another resource, from another website. Uh, so let's check our references. All right, so on the NJS website, there is a reference section. Well, let's go back, NJS, and then you have references. And here you have basically all the different, the different NJS objects and variables that are available. So this is for the request. This is r.arguments. So this is HTTP context. And we want to see or want to check the stream session, this part. Stream session. And as I said, this applies only to the stream module. And then we have s.on. This is what we see in our in the code from Valent or from Dimitri, s on an event we call a function. And this is what we have here. So on upload, the function will be called with. No, this is this is basically the event, and then we have the callback function that takes the data as well as the flag. So this is how you can read and understand the NJS documentation when you want to build something. Make sure you're on the right module, stream or HTTP. It's like with all the other Nginx configuration um, documentation as well. And then make sure you, are, you see this is the stream and then we are on, we have the event upload new data in string typed from the client. And then we have a callback function, which is data and flags. Good. So then if, so then we say the collect was initialized here. We remember var <laughs> function scope and we append the imported chunks into a variable called collect. We assign it. And if the collect length, is at least five or greater than five and the collect starts with magic. So that means the string of the first bytes of our input stream starts with magic. We use the nginx fetch method. And this one is pretty new that comes in version five from of um, the NJS implementation. So what we do here is we reach out to an HTTP server. In our case, something we have created with Nginx as well, port 8080 validate, and we send a host header and a couple of bytes from our input to this validate function. And then in the validate function. So this is the important, this is the, the interesting thing I've mentioned last week. You do not have to write multiple NJS files for your different functions. You can have one file, one for a function that's loaded from inside the stream context and another one that will be loaded from, um, uh, the HTTP context, see this, this is the request object as an input and not the stream. 
and here we say look if I oh, see that's that's in see that's 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 exactly why I've showed you the uh, this Elvis if operator because in in a lot of demos um, you will notice that this is like the short version of an if our request text equals equal to QZ we say 200 if it's not if this is false we return 403 so that's basically all that all that happens here we fetch and send a couple of bytes to our validate HTTP endpoint it's like the auth request for nginx and the fetch and now again we check the documentation right how that works so this is njx fetch means this is an nginx or an njs object or nginx object so we can go up 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 nginx objects we have the http request we have a stream session r s a response object and this is njx here so we click on this is a global object available since version 5.0 and then here we have fetch. So again, I'm, I'm slowing down here a little bit because it's very important that you understand how to read the documentation behind NJS um, to be able to write the code you need and to get the information you need from, from the documentation. All right, so Nginx fetch makes a request to a fetch URL and returns a promise resolves with a response object. All right, so a promise um, was the thing we have covered in the first part of this um, live stream. And it was mentioned as yeah something from ECMAScript 6 that's already, that's yeah available inside of, um, of NJS right now. And a promise is a very, very cool feature when it comes to um, a non-blocking infrastructure. So what we do is we send a request to this validate endpoint and a promise is really like a promise in real life. It is. So what, what do we have here talking in non-developer language? A promise is something like that. I say, look, give me your request and I will promise that you will see somehow a response. I cannot tell you what the response will be, but I will promise you there will be something, right? All right, so you're handing me over the, the request and I will send the request. And then based on the response or what it is, if it's, if the promise resolves, I think that's the right, that's the right word in the uh, JavaScript world. If the promise resolves, so then I, I, uh, yeah, I took, my promise and I really did the right thing and I returned with something. That's the then part. So if nginx fetch, the promise is resolved successfully. So that means it is a true thing. Then we do this. If it's not resolved, um, then we can close it and we deny in that case the, uh, the connection. So in here, then reply is the actual response from our fetch. And if you want to see what's possible here, there is a reply reference, returns a promise that resolves in a response object. Cool, a response object is available since one and we have reply.status see and so why i'm pointing you out to this all this interesting documentation here is that i'm it's really important to understand what are what are the types what is a response object because if you understand what a response object is you understand what can I do with it. In this case, we are interested in the HTTP status code that is part of the response. 
So the response is an object and to x to x is an, an attribute or property of object we can use dot and this is simple JavaScript language. Um, but if you want to see what is available, you can check the response object here, the definition, and can see, all right, I have a response object and my response object has a ton of attributes. It has headers. I can take the JSON out of it. I can check something Boolean with OK, or I can get the HTTP status code. And if the HTTP status code in our case is 200, then we do done. So we say successful, great. If not, we close the connection, we deny. Or if the length of the request is less than five, we deny. So this was an example how to read NJ, NJS code, how to check the documentation according to the code, um, and how to get the most out of the out of the um, example page. Great. Cool. So let's go back in here and check the nginx configuration here, um, which is in conf, I guess, and then is stream auth request.conf. So we have this and now let's copy this. Let's copy this over and we have our, uh, all right, yeah, I'm, I'm adding the Nginx configuration here because of demo purpose in your environments, you should import or include something like this um, to keep the Nginx conf as clean as possible in, um, in our case, I think that's, that's not needed. All right, um, so we have port 8,900. We have the main pre-read verify here. Export is here, great. Proxy pass is to 8081. And this returns backend. So, and this is interesting part here. That means if the pre-read phase logic condition in our NJS code allows the request to go over the pre-read phase, it will automatically go to the proxy pass. If we skip this or if we deny this based on some validations we do here, the client will see an error message and will not come to this proxy pass here. That's basically what we have here. This is demo purpose. Um, to see the backend, um, and yeah, that's that's probably number one. Number two is we need our HTTP configuration for our vali validate backend here. Um, so not inside of the stream, but inside of uh, this configuration, and to keep this all a little bit in in a, in one file, even if this is not the best practice, let me add this directly here. All right. So we have something like 8080. Oh, let me grab here. JS, NJS, server, validate. Um, it has another JS content for validate, which is great. So let's keep this. Right. So as you see, we can, the imports are based on the, um, on the main context. So we need to do this in stream and in the HTTP context simultaneously, if you want to use the same logic in our HTTP context. Um, so then we have a server, let me copy that. So I can, can have, I have a little bit more time to explain what's going on with this code. All right, we listen on port 8080. I think that's fine. We have a server name, AAA. Um, 
that's basically the host header. I think that's a little bit of an of a demo purpose that we can see that we can add headers um, inside of fetch. It will work without the server name as well. Um, but this will show you that we can add headers inside fetch. So let's keep this validate location is good. We have this right and inside of the validate location, we have something like JS content and JS content means that at the point where request hits this location block, the JS function based on or in module main function validate will take care of the response that we will send to this request inside of this location. So meaning we send a request to validate the JS function validate from the module main will check something, right? So that's here. And then we will say like, okay, is it 200 is it 403? So basically what we do here is we return with an HTTP status code given on a specific, um, on a specific if condition. This is a pretty simple use case, but you can do a lot inside of this validate function. You can check whatever complex thing you may want to check. You can do, um, yeah, checks of, of CNs, uh, so certificate names of chains of whatever. Um, I have created inside of a, or while I was working as a professional services engineer for Nginx, um, I have created a NJS file with almost 600 lines of JavaScript code doing a, a very, very complex checking of stuff. Um, and it was very, very performant. It was very fast. And yeah, just as an example that you can put a lot more logic and a lot more complex things inside of a, of an NJS function. Good. So we have JS content, we load the validate function and we import a request object um, automatically. So you do not have to do this manually here. It will automatically inject it inside of the, of the function. Good. So we have a listen 8080. We have a server name. We have a validate location. We have JS content. We load the modules folder and we load auth request JS. All right. So given that unexpected in Nginx con 39, this sounds like a missing semicolon. Uh, let me see. We are in HTTP. Mm -hmm -hmm. Oh, I think I know that's HTTP. That's opening. Uh, that's the server. Could have heard of this dude. Okay. Why is the con stuff working in here, but not my config. We have a server, we listen on 8080, we have a server name, we have a location validate. Right. I th yeah, I think it was a, because that's, that's totally fine. That's correct. That's correct. Closing open, open, close. This is HTTP context closing. Um, that's great. So let's check our Nginx configuration by T. Oops. I think All right, so these are includes, MIME types. This is the stream, 8,900, that's correct. 8080, that's correct. 
Good. Almost like a thing. Uh, so let's go back to the config on Dimitri. And see the example stream. Nginx conf example checking. Jeez, Telnet, love it. Uh, uh, now I think I need to cheat a little bit because we are just exposing one port that goes to 8080. Um, but it's not a problem. We cheat a little bit. We go inside of the container. Docker exec it njs bin bash. Clear this. I think it is based on Ubuntu or Debian. Sorry, Ubuntu. Oops. Upt update and that up. Yep, it's Debian. So let's install Telnet and let's do this from inside the container. Um, oh, that was a question. Um, hey, Johnny. To support async and await. Uh, that's a probably good question. Um, let me see if I if we have something. I know that something like asynchrone um, timers are not supported at the moment. So something like a, a specific set timeout will not work with NJS. Um, yeah, and yeah, the only thing we have at the moment, I think, are, are promises. Um, I don't think we have something like async await, but um, this is a good good question because that leads me to the thing that we can do this um, compat compatibility check here, and uh, yeah, this brings us back to the to the ECMAScript standard, and I don't think we have the promise. Yeah, the promise is the only asynchrone um, version. This is file system, um, but the same is for the normal. Uh, promises so I I don't have a specific answer um, if this is it is not supported today and but I will check this um, I will check this with the with the engineering team tomorrow um, if there are any plans to do the async um, await um, support from ES6. Um, another th another uh, another thing you can do is you can ask so such questions on the NJS uh, GitHub repository. There is a there is a um, a GitHub repository. And there is the issue page where you can ask questions as well. It will flag as a question. Um, so let's see if there is something. Refactor of FS module, promise all. Um, promise all. Polyfill. I mean, there is something, something like this. Uh, but yeah, as I said, the the only the only thing we have at the moment is a promise. It's better to avoid loops when doing promises without async await. Uh, yeah, yeah. Check out the um, issue number three five two, um, Johnny. Maybe that maybe that will. 
that will answer uh, the question. Great, so now we have Telnet installed. Um, and I think we can, because we are right away destroying the container and blowing it up. So let's install net tools. Do you have something like netstat available as well? So we can check if the ports are open or not. I love Docker hacking like this. Cool. So let's do netstat uh, tulpn pipe grab listen. Oops, let's see what we have. We have 8,900 and we have 80. Yeah, good, but we have 8081. Right, why is this not a th thing? We have TCP. All right. So let's try Telnet. Localhost 8900. So Dimitri said, if we type hi nginx, connection closed by foreign host because we sent a bad request. And what was our magical character? Was it Q, QZ? All right, so the last. All right, great. Demo God is not with me. I think that's because I did something wrong. Um, right, somehow it is not doing the thing it should do. So let me do this. Let me open another terminal. And let's check. Let me do one more thing. So we listen on 8900. We do this. Pre read verify 8080. A little bit concerned that we do not have 8080 open. But we should. All right, I think. All right, that's a problem. 8900 is already be used by another mock backend from me. That's my. That's my fault. Sorry. Let's try that with 9090. There you go. That's much better. Um, sorry for the confusion. It was probably my fault. I had 98,900 for my uh, for my JS filter from our last session um, for the mock backend here. Um, and yeah, that's that's probably the reason why. Yeah, that's probably the reason why our demo wasn't working at the moment. But you see, um, yeah, interesting, an interesting side note about this, that if you define something on the stream context that is listening on the same port than something in your um, HTTP context, it will not kick out any error. It will just not work. Um, yeah. Interesting to know if you work with stream and HTTP context on the same instance, that this, this could, be, could be a thing. All right, so now we have 8,900. Uh, 90, 90. Hi. 
that looks much better because it's not an HTTP response. It was an HTTP response and now let's see. Yay, it is working, hallelujah. Um, great, so again, side note, be careful with your ports as always and uh, make sure you're not using a port that you use inside of the HTTP context in your stream context. Cool, so what we see here is we make a telnet, so we establish a TCP connection to our port 8990. And now our service here is waiting for an input. So we need, we have we can send or we should send and we should send input data. And if the first five, so if the first bytes or the first characters are start with magic, fine. If not, so that means when we say something like hi, we're in here, we're in the deny block. So that means the connection will be closed, good. So if we start with magic and then we did in our checking, we say if magic QZ is, is the thing, because we slice from position five so six and seven. So the last two characters, Q set. So this backend means that our proxy kicked in. So let's change this and say, hello to YouTube live stream. Oops. Reload. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Good, and we do the same again, we check magic QZ is hello YouTube live stream. Cool, and so yeah, that means we, we specify the re request, request body. We, need, we take the data and slice the last two characters and send it to our validate location. The validated location will use a JS content, layer seven HTTP context. And we'll check if there is the request text or the request body will be QZ. If it is, we save 200, if not 403. And that's exactly what we see here. So that was an example of how to use the JS fetch or the NJS fetch functionality, which is pretty, pretty new inside of the pre-read phase of an incoming connection to check the data, validate the data on an HTTP service, an HTTP listener. In that case, we are using another NJS function to do the validation as well. Love it. That was a cool example. Um, so. What we learned here, to go back um, a step and see what we learned, is we can use NJS in stream as well as in HTTP context. We can have multiple functions in the same file imported in layer four and layer seven, so HTTP and stream context. We can have something like a whole logic of how to handle a specific location or the request of a specific location inside of uh, JavaScript. And with the NJS for stream module, we have access to a lot of different phases of the Nginx request processing. Access phase, pre-read phase, filter is before the response. set data filter and access is at the access phase. And if you want to know more about faces, we can click here and see this is access pre-read content. So access phase is earlier, already earlier than pre-read. 
Um, so that means at the point where we establish a connection. So that means at the point where we do this here, um, this is like, like then, then here and uh, way too early because we are not accepted any data. So what should we validate? Um, but pre-read is a good thing. So where, so we can use this, for example, when we want to do some uh, checking with uh, connections or with proxying to Redis, MySQL, anything like postfix, IMAP, whatever you can imagine, anything where you want to intercept some some, let's say, good readable protocols. Um, this could be a good solution to do some more validations and, and, and checks here. Great. So unfortunately, we are on top of the second hour. Uh, that's a bummer um, because I would like to do some more HTTP based um, layer seven examples especially how to use the Node.js um, the Node.js development thing. Um, but I think it is a good opportunity to schedule another live stream session um, soon, maybe at the weekend um, to touch point this, because I'm pretty sure if, if, I'm, if I start doing this now, um, we will need another 45 minutes to explain why it is useful to use Node.js for, um, because of, um, for development, when you have some pre-capsulated logic from a node module. Um, and yeah, I think I've, unfortunately, I think we're running out of time then. So. Um, yeah, let me, let me know if you have any questions right now. So, um, Johnny, I hope your question is answered and yeah, make sure you check this issue on GitHub and I will check back with our engineering team and we'll leave a comment under that video and answer that, that question for sure. And if not, I will schedule another live stream to check back on the Node.js development and explain how that can be used together with, with NJS. Um, so yeah, it was a very, very cool session. I enjoyed it. It was a very long live stream, two hours, um, probably my longest live stream. And we learned a lot about the beginning of JavaScript about the ECMAScript standard. Now we understand if we go to the uh, compatibility page, what is mean by compliance with ECMAScript 5.1 and ECMAScript 6. And when we look into this list of features, what we can do, for example, with objects, what we can do with arrays, that we now know what is concat, what is filter, what is for each, what is index, what is slice. And if you're keen how to use those functions or what are the params, we learn different resources. We learned the MDN here, as well as the ECMA standard itself, where you can check the implementations and how it should be implemented. So, Given that means that we have now a set of references to learn more about JavaScript development with Nginx and NJS, what's possible. And yeah, j just that we run that much out of time shows me that there is a lot to talk about. There is a lot to cover um, and obviously less time uh, in the live streams. If you liked it, subscribe uh, and leave a comment, um, like the video, and I'm sure I will be back in a couple of days with another NJS live stream about Node.js um, 
and how to use npm modules, how to browserify and pre-compile it to make it work with NJS. Um, in deep dive, check out the video from last week. Our um, our live stream from last week, the extending nginx configuration with NJS. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you liked it. I liked it a lot. It's always fun hacking around um, in the evening and yeah, bring the the awesomeness of, of our products and, and projects um, to the community. Thanks a lot for joining. Um, I wish you a good evening, a pleasant day, um, a good rest of the week. And yeah, hopefully we will see soon. Subscribe, leave a comment and a like if you like the video. I liked it a lot and have a good one. Goodbye.